So it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be on stage this evening with one of my very favorite artists. So I'm going to do almost no talking um, because you have so much to say uh, actually and visually and in every imaginable way. Um, so there are a number of people in the audience who know something about your personal story and your personal journey. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to start at what for most people is a milestone. Um, but I think if you're um, contemplating a career as an artist, it takes a particular kind of commitment to decide to go get an MFA at one of the most competitive graduate schools and uh, programs in the country. So was this a milestone? And how did you decide it? Uh, and how has it impacted what you've done subsequently, uh, your experience going to Hunter? So before going to grad school, before even that decision came to be, I had to um, kind of unlearn all the beautiful things I had learned at Cooper Union. That was like art boot camp. So two years to just find my voice again. To I had this incredible tool set. Find my voice and then decide, all right, this is what I actually want to say while working on five different jobs to survive in New York, and having no time to put down on paper all the things I wanted to say. So that's when I decided I need to go to grad school. I need to, that's the one place where I can have time aside from this race that is surviving New York and being in the art world. Um, and so there are uh, uh, maybe a handful of grad schools that you know are going to be um, launching points to this big but very small art world. Um, and so as someone who was self-sustained, I w didn't want to have my art world, my, yeah, my, my work be something that was crippling. That after I left grad school, I didn't want to feel like I then had to contend with $200,000, $300,000 in debt. And so I chose places to apply to, but I knew that would not be a factor. Um, so I chose Hunter because it's at the very center of where I wanted to be, who I wanted to speak to, and it, wa it meant that I could work and not come out with so much debt. So when you were at both Cooper Union and Hunter, were there particular professors who influenced your thinking and your practice? Absolutely. So one of them is a fellow Caribbean Airy Ward. He actually is someone who, at Cooper, we were um, really, we became master materialists. Like we knew all the processes, all the materials, and were obsessed with making things archival. Like anything we made had to survive for the next hundred years. <coughs> and Nary is someone who's you know, he's very much in, al in alignment with Arte Povera, and that's about, you know, how to make things of the present and leave the conservation to conservators. If they can recreate a cigarette for a Pollock, they can recreate whatever you're making in your work. So he said, just make it, just um, let it go. And that's where I really allowed so many things to happen, like treating paper as a material that is alive, that is corporeal, that um, reflects the environment, and that's more than likely because of him. So, so let's t talk a little bit more about influencers. Um, in our ongoing conversations, um, I mean, I'm so impressed uh, by your ability to assimilate a large amount of information from a broad variety of sources. Um, and so I've heard you talk about Edouard Glissant and Octavia Butler as writers who've influenced you and philosophers. Um, so maybe you could give us some insight into writers who've influenced you and other artists who've influenced your practice. That's kind of like the <laughs> picking a grain of sand out of this vast like array, but um, because Especially now, we have waves and waves of information. And even at a peer level, like Sam Burnham's in the crowd, and she's an amazing artist that 
we are constantly, I look at her work, um, and, you know, there are Zoe McCloskey as someone who is also an artist who was my freshman roommate. But in terms of um, all these other influences, I feel like I'm constantly looking at artists and writers who are like mechanical engineers almost, looking at all the parts of systems and taking them apart and really giving you a different way of looking at the world. And Aimé Césaire and Glissant were two writers coming out of the Caribbean who really um, gave this tool set to not just the Caribbean, but to a lot of the Francophone world and consequently to Anglophone world of how to contend with, we think of rhizomes, we think of all these ways of interconnectivity between um, as a way of, of relating to the world, and that's all coming out of those two writers. Um, so, thinking of that, and then um, artists like Lorna Simpson, who is, and Carrie Mae Weems, who are, um, again, looking at, through a very intimate lens, how um, the things that make up our daily interactivity and um, the barriers and doorways we create for each other. And so is there any particular strand in those two practices? I mean, you can look at Lorna's early work, um, you know, from the early 90s, her sort of serial photography, and make parallels to your work. Um, but are there any particular things around identity that you take away, say, from Lorna's work? I feel like everything to the it's hard to pinpoint it down because I, I do love the early series. Like even my self-portrait series that lasted for several years yeah. was very much referencing her um, <laughs> using the body as a hygrometer, as a barometer of culture and both nature and nurture. Um, but even the feminine look, the, um, the self-possession, that's even in her recent work, that really intense blue. And I'm always interested in how um, materially um, color has such significance. And it's been a marker of so much social movement. So to see a figure out of an Ebony or Jet magazine look back and the way that she constructs and she's pairing Greek um, uh, artifacts with those same artifacts from uh, Ebony and Jet and um, making, recreating and pairing our ideals of beauty. It's just, you know, that's now, that's in Chelsea now. So you can't really pinpoint. So, 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 so we'll come back to blue because actually I'm intrigued by your use of blue. And I would say that you sort of have pursued an intense focus on blue before Lorna did, Lorna really started focusing on blue in 2015, 2016, and you Which I were. I think she saw some of my stuff. She probably saw some new stuff. Girl. I don't know. I take care of it. Um, but uh, so, but you were onto the blue thing long before. But we'll get we'll get back to that. Um, you know, it was also particularly gratifying um, to sort of watch you in a studio visit with uh, a curator who is someone I respect um, more than most people. Um, uh, a, a guy by the name of Mark Godfrey at, at Tate, and he was asking the same question, what artists are influencers, and um, you mentioned Olafur Eliasson, and he happens to be the world's expert on o Olafur Eliasson, and I don't think I told you afterwards, I didn't know. afterwards he asked me, did you cue her for that? I said, no, she just said it out of the blue, right? So, so maybe you can share with this group, um, and there's just, just FYI, there's a major Olafur Eliasson uh, survey show that's opening up now. I guess it's yeah. opening this week at uh, Tate Modern. Uh, so he was deep into Olafur Eliasson uh, research mode. Um, so um, tell us why that's compelling. So he would never think, or I don't think he would think of his work in those terms. Um, but I remember... I, at Cooper, I was like the biggest art geek. I wanted to learn every methodology, um, which meant that I didn't really know about Chelsea until a year after graduating. My world was the Lower East Side. Um, 
but during my junior year, we were given the chance to study abroad. And one program that I chose to do was to go to Italy. And we started in Naples and ended up in Venice. And that meant I got to see the biennial that year. It's the same year that they had Chris Ophelia and David Ajay do the British Pavilion. And Oliver Eliasson was there. And his room was this incredible yellow room that turned everything black and white. His work is so much about perception. And I feel like as painters, we're constantly doing that same gesture very quickly. We make those decisions to make you see, but they're so seamless that we take them for granted. But he slows it down and makes you do what we do in seconds as painters and extends it to a ex whole entire exhibition. Um, so the fallibility of sight, the fact that everything we construct is a construct, everything we see is a construct, was so incredible. And that was the first time seeing that, that I've, um, you know, I have been aware of the paperback test, for instance. And for me, that's so close to what he was doing in that room. Um, we are constantly imposing constructs on each other. Um, so I love that about him, and I feel like Every day that I'm in the studio painting, I, I feel like we're, I'm in that lineage. So I think I saw something on your Instagram page that said, too cute to be binary. <laughs> <laughs> and so what that means, the way I interpret that, um, sort of, you know, um, being a student of your practice, um, I love being a student of your practice because what I know is how little I know. There's always stuff to unpack, things to see, and even objects that I live with that I haven't seen before, there's always something new. So I wanted to explore some of the themes and conceptual underpinnings in your work, uh, because I find them that the, the number of themes and the depth to which you explore them mind-bending and dizzying. And so, I mean, I'm just going to give you sort of a laundry list of some of the things that I'm aware of and I hear you talk about, but I know there are many, many, many other things. But when you step back or up 35,000 feet, I guess the major takeaway from this strand of the conversation is your practice defies being put in any single box. So maybe you can give us just, you know, you know uh, an overview of the very multifaceted um, uh, conceptual underpinnings. So history certainly is one. Colonialism is a, a theme that you explore in depth. Globalism. Identity is kind of a catch-all, and maybe we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, feminism, your female characters and personae are um, uh, really strong um, um, messages. Uh, this notion of ambiguity and being non-binary. So, so have at it. Yeah. Well, I think um, maybe an anchor that some people might uh, find resonance with is Octavia Butler. And I always look at myth builders, both contemporary and from my childhood and from history, that are really doing all that work. We have these catchphrases like identity and non-binary, but the nuance, the grit in that, within that, have been constantly being given to us as psychic guards by people like the Siguapas of my upbringing, these like female folkloric badass creatures that came out of the forest, that in one side of the story are told as a warning of what not to be. And then as if you look underneath are basically the, the battle gear we get to fight those binary norms, to say, actually, I can choose to be this. I can choose to be fierce in this way and um, face the world on my terms. So um, I feel like being attentive to all that, the things that are being sent to us or that are being taught on a daily basis are um, sometimes seen as like things that, oh, what artists are seeing this, or, or how did you get this? But they're, you know, our parents are telling them to us all the time, even if it's a warning, even if it's a, maybe you should not try this, but 
underneath it's like, hey, you have this. You have all these things that you could work with. So I'm really struck by all the things that you, in fact, do work with. Um, and some artists have, you know, sort of a really um, narrow range of images and concepts they work with. But you have a pretty broad iconographic vocabulary. Um, but some of my favorites um, that I read about and heard you talk about are, let's go back a little bit to color. Um, and let's talk about the use of blue and indigo and um, the images of uh, Delft porcelain patterning uh, in, in your work. So um, I think before we go into Delft patterning, I'd like to, it, it, the seed of all of it is a term or a phrase like true blue American. And then breaking that down like, what does it mean to be true blue American and going into the genes and what is the indigo making up those genes and where did we process because indigo itself doesn't come as blue like ultramarine is this stone that comes from Afghanistan we have that direct history and colonization but indigo is a chemical process that comes out of a green plant and there are processes that came down out of you know now we have things out of Egypt in Peru, but the American one was a process that was learned from enslaved people in the South that then fueled maybe two thirds of the American economy. When we think about industrialization and modernity, you have to say and account for that. How um, this science, this magic, was processed from people that were enslaved, how do you give back? How do you um, equate the fact that true blue American means West African indigo? Um, and then find the space in that, how, how incredibly generative it has been um, to have that. And then if you take it away from the US or if you expand this conversation outside the US, you think of the Caribbean, Saint Domingue, where I'm from which is both Dominican Republic and Haiti. And you think of enlightenment and beautiful palaces in Paris and cafes where intellectual conversations were happening that themselves are funded by both bodies and ideas coming out of Saint-Domingue and Martinique. Martinique alone had more people taken out of Africa than the entirety of the US, that little island. So then, um, thinking of, we're, we're familiar with the toll it took, the physical toll, but the fact that there have been exchanges of ideas and skills and um, goods for hundreds of years, um, and that maybe um, there is this, uh, we're used to having these lines of influence, like uh, we have history from Africa or history from Europe, but we've been speaking back for a very long time, um, and part of it is, the tignon, which is red, thinking of the color red and the color blue. Um, but yeah, I'm, I like how loaded color is. And then that patterning that you're thinking of as Delft and um, yes. this porcelain patterning, it's more um, referencing the indigo toile that happened, that you um, would have, that a proper lady could wear if... Um, she was basically an acting empire. Um, if she was in these different spaces, she could have access to a specific fine cotton in this indigo that was extracted and that meant this exchange of goods between spaces. And so tell us a little bit more about red. I remember you know, encountering a monumental painting, uh, maybe two Venice Biennales ago when you were in the uh, Pinchuk Prize. Um, you know, this massive Tignon painting in cardinal red. Um, what's sort of, let's unpack sort of the different levels of meaning. Um, and some of you might already know about it, but um, red was also a color that you had to pay a tax. It was called cardinal red because only members of the church could wear it without paying a fee. But if you were a regular person, you had to pay a very, very high tax. 
it was like, you know, driving a Bugatti today, or it was an extreme luxury good. Um, unless you lived in the Americas and you were part of that extraction process. It actually came out of this cochineo bug. Um, if you have organic strawberry yogurt, you'll probably have crushed little bugs in it um, that make it safe to eat. <laughs> but um, they only survive on Nopal and um, have there were all kinds of intrigue from England, from all these other countries on how to take it away from Spain, which was the main, um, and Portugal was the main growers of it. So um, I'm interested in how, who had access to that color and um, what it meant to be able to freely wear it. And at the time it meant that you had to, again, be an acting empire. Um, there's actually, one show that I, I really love, and it's probably the one, there's a lot of these global shows that happen, but they usually end up having like this continent here, this continent there. There's never really the interwovenness of it. Um, and the Met had this exhibition called Interwoven Globe, and they showed all these textiles that were, you know, exchanges between. And one of them was this incredibly violent one um, which it was this like little scrap of cotton with cochineal red, and it was this um, America uh, depicted as a woman, as a female trophy, being carried in a litter by a black man and a native man. And the text underneath it was the triumph of Spain and the Americas, triunfa, el triunfo de España en América. And it's like, you know, you would go to your, the ball, some fashionable young girl could wear it, but in the essence, it's so violent. Um, and seeing how this print in a style of a South Asian art done in a cotton extracted from the American South with this cochineal bug taken out of Mexico all came together into this one gown. Um, it's wow. Just, yeah, intense. <laughs> so that the Tignon reference that. Well, so the Tino and the Saguapa are uh, both um, a sort of um, part of your iconography that, that comes up continually. Um, these were histories about which I knew nothing. And so I guess my question is, um, as you, you know, talk to art lovers around the world about your work and those two bits of history, what's the most surprising question you've gotten? Um, because I, I, I would imagine I'm not singular, where, where these histories are, are not broadly known, and so you're unpacking them visually and substantively for us. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that are uh, asked to me, and this is like, you know, history is constantly, we're constantly mining it and trying to get a, a better picture, because so much of the writing, sometimes you have to like work from the the outside echo to see what's not said as much as what's being said. And um, the history of the Tignon was again a sumptuary law where um, some of you guys might know of it already, where essentially it was outlawing, outlawing um, black women's bodies, particularly their hair. And these were a class of women called places in New Orleans who had um, the freedom and the money to buy property that they could pass down, the they could buy their family's freedom. Um, so they had a lot of social mobility. And when New Orleans, um, when the French were fighting Haiti and the you know only free black republic in the Western Hemisphere, they were like, we have a small insurrection. Why don't you guys take this place over to their Spanish cousins? And one of the first things that the Spanish did was to put this law in place. Um, the Spanish were notorious for having very strict caste systems. We we're so aware of like the caste system in India, but the Spanish had it to the like 23rd degree, um, where in, next to your saints, you would have a small painting telling you who you were supposed to be, you, how, to, how to enact your identity in the world, depending on your mix, admixture. So um, there are some incredible ones in the Fine Arts um, Museum in Boston that you can probably see in there. Some of the most intimate, beautiful paintings of mixed families that you'll see from the 1500s, 
but then you realize how violent, how inherently violent they are. Um, losing my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> so back to, to New Orleans and the Tignon, how um, because of that very strict system, they um, thought these women were a threat to the moral core. Like, you are not acting the way that our paintings say you should be, our system says you should be. Um, so they made them wear this headscarf, this head covering, to say, you're not one of us, you're actually one of the house slave. And these women were, of course, badasses, and they were not going to, they turned this system of oppression, this symbol of, like, that was meant to demean them into a symbol of power, and turned it into this beautiful headdress that you look at portraits of Empress Josephine and a lot of women in Europe, it became a fashion statement there. Colonialism in North Africa and in the Middle East, but they were a conversation back to the Caribbean. And there's a uh, posing modernity exhibition in France yeah. right now, and she makes a point about there's a lot of historic paintings where that were labeled like Arab women or Indian women, but they were actually paintings of black models of Caribbean women that were back, um, going back and forth. Um, so, just how this fashion statement, this uh, intimate gesture, can have such broad social implications, and how you can use the personal as political. We're so we're familiar with that phrase now, but that's been something that's been happening for a very long time that women have been working with. But that just thinking of that policing of the body then is the same thing that's happening now. And that we can very concretely see too in the army, the women whose hair was outlawed, um, whose protective styling was basically, you know, not proper but they're basically giving their lives for and limb for a country. Um, so you can't, how the two are equated is always fascinating how it continues. How do we stop that? These are great questions. So um, before I turn it over to the audience um, to ask you questions, I have a couple more things I wanna talk about and maybe we can go to the few images of the works that are in our collection um, let's, uh, uh, let's start with that one. Yeah, let's start with that one. So, um, this work was shown in Franklin Sermon's Prospect 3, and this is when I first became familiar, uh, with your practice. Um, and so I'm, um, amazed by and confused by the broad array of tools that you use in your practice and your great ambidexterity. Um, and so maybe you can speak a little bit about how and when you choose to deploy different tools. And what I mean by that is sometimes you're working in figuration, sometimes you're working in abstraction, sometimes you're working in a place that is so in between, it defies categorization. You work in painting and installation. I think, you know, as we flip through the things that we own, you'll see I'm not even sure I would call this one a painting. There's another one. The first one was a painting, and we'll come to that. Painting versus installation, paper versus canvas. And then you really almost, I mean, you work also, you know, interdimensionally. How do you decide when to work in two dimensions and three dimensions? And I would point to your Highline installation as a truly three-dimensional uh, object. I guess it's a matter of... They're all portraiture. They're all trying to invoke a person. And so much of um, portraiture as a person of color, like we're always tied to figuration, but how do you free the body? How Finding ways of giving room to be without locking it in, um, so that or, or giving more information than a depiction can possibly give. So for instance, for this image, it did start as a very tightly rendered portrait. It was actually referencing one of the, um, I don't know what, uh, there, this early photography type um, that was passed down in cards of Creole women. So basically that headdress that Tignon became the proper wear for any middle class woman throughout the Caribbean. And so it had a very late version of a tignon, of, a, of that elaborate headscarf, um, from a woman in Martinique. And so I wanted to imbue this portrait with everything kind of 
having a butterfly effect of everything that made her then to the present. Um, and so that meant that there are maybe 20 different paintings in that to try to bring it, make it more of a palimpsest, to make you really look and come back and, and be drawn and, and pulled back from it. Well, and so, I mean, that actually, uh, thank you for that explanation, actually, because, you know, I mean, as you know, we primarily collect abstraction, but your work doesn't feel at all in conflict with that sensibility. Um, but I've never quite been able to articulate it, and now I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm finding the words for it. And then if we could skip to the, if we could skip a few and go, that's the one. Um, and this is similar to uh, one that's installed in the show. Um, and this is, I mean, one of my favorite paintings in the whole collection. But it, I'm, I'm not understanding where the portraiture is. And maybe you could also tell us that and whether um, you feel that you work serially or you, do you skip around from uh, between, um, you know, sort of themes in your, um, you know, defined set of um, language and image making? I don't know if it's because of... Um the art practice, like um, that you're constantly meeting different demands or you're trying to pinpoint something. But I, I, as an artist, think of myself as working more with time. So I'll have all kinds of different projects happening at the same time. And I'm learning the mark from this one informs the other. And it's almost an accumulation of tools, an accumulation of texture that um, will then inform. So I've been actually working with these archival materials, these books um, that I have been doing accessions from libraries around the world. I first started with ones from the Cooper Union, but these actually came out of a residency in New Orleans. I was at the Joan Mitchell Center, and they had this WPA book of significant sites within New Orleans, um, within Louisiana, actually. And they, I wanted to focus in on the markers that, for me, felt um, very loaded and very historically significant to it. Um, and this here is actually a blueprint of the Robert E. Lee monument that came down. Um, so the date references when it was taken down. And if you look very closely at the very top, he's right there. And I wanted to, he's at the very center of that Explosion. So that's the portraiture. That's the portraiture. But for me, it's yeah. not even... It's but not we even, blew him up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's more portraiture in the sense that um, of the paper itself. For me, more than him, it's the foxing around the edges of the print. It's the... Because foxing is captured breath. It's every viewer that came and saw that image and left a mark. It was slowly... More than the marks that I made afterward, almost conspiring with me or co-conspiring with me to destroy a history of exclusion. Um, so every time we look at a book, every time we um, leave our breath, every time we're curious about a story, we're leaving parts of ourselves in it. Um, and that's <laughs> how interesting. It's one of the things I most love about looking at old miniatures, like Persian miniatures. You have this very intricate mark and then on the edges, the things that conservators hate are the things I love. <laughs> we have conservators in the group, so. Or maybe it could be, you know, an extension like, that you can have a better appreciation of all the things that are breaking down this beautiful page or that are co-creating the marks on that page. So if we could go to the installation. Um, I'm really excited about this. I've been thinking about this all day. I, this is the most recent uh, piece we've bought, not only a Fairlays, but in the collection. And we're going to install this environment in our home. Um, and I've got all kinds of ideas I need to, to, um, to, to share with you. But tell us, who are these women? And the next one. So um, these are, so I've been really fascinated by um, the myth of the Drexian group. They're this DJ group that um, basically did this um, album and for the cover and for, I guess, conceptualizing for it, um, we're thinking of almost in an Atlantis-like way um, of this new whole other being, or whole other people, of um, maybe reframing the stories of the Middle Passage, the women who were pregnant, who were tossed overboard, 
what happened to their kids? What if their kids were able to make a whole new water breathing race? Mm -hmm. And what would those lives have been like? Mm -hmm. And then thinking of Glissant's connecting of the islands, thinking of the ocean not as a separator, but as this inherent connection between different lands, um, the Caribbean being a series of archipelagos. Mm -hmm. And so centering these women with a tignon, centering um, these new water breathing humans in the underneath the night sky at the inception of the Haitian Revolution. It, you can, um, there are several applications online, including NASA, where you can have a capture of any night above any city for the past 2,000 years. So there are varying dates for when the Haitian Revolution happened. There was a ceremony that happened before it. And it's a matter of three weeks. So I had to choose one of the two. So the one in your installation is one of the two nights when it potentially happened. But thinking of all the female priestesses who were the spark, who were inherently necessary for it to happen, we have all these historic stories of, you know, the generals. Toussaint is, you know, epic. He's one of our heroes. But all these unnamed women, including King Henry Christophe's wife and daughters, were very necessary for it. Where many times the ones who were literate and who were translating texts back and forth. So they were the interlocutors both in religion and in this very uh, processed culture. So centering them in this space was the impetus. So I'm going to release you to, to people shortly, but I'm just going to ask a few brief questions. <laughs> well, one, 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 one more, and then I'm going to turn it over. So, you know, a lot of people in this audience think about, um, you know, sort of the ecology of the art world and their place in it and what they can do to um, make it a more inclusive place, make it a more representational place. If you, um, you know, had all of the power, powerful energy of one of your backwards walking badass Zaguapas, and you could create a set of resources um, that you would want to be available, what would that look like? Well, more, or I guess at the heart of it, would be collectors who actually were invested in ideas that had the potential to transform the world. But if you have someone who's in, as invested as you are in making these ideas public and in transforming how we see, like one of the most um, like soul gratifying things that ever happened was to, as a practicing artist, as a Dominican, to see the story I grew up with, my images of it become the thing that concretizes it. So when you do a search for a Siwapa, my images are some of the first things that come to it. Um, young Dominican artists are looking at my work and they're having, you know, feelings that they're being seen. So having that conversation back and forth is really priceless. But outside of that, if we could, you know, one of the biggest taboos in art school was ever talking about actually being a practicing artist. We had zero skill sets in that sense. Um, and it was frowned upon to think, how do I conduct a studio visit? How do I do this life to day to day? Admin is like soul crushing. But admin is such a big part of being a practicing artist, like being any professional in the world. So if we had just a bit more of that, that would be really fantastic. That way more of us would survive. It's kind of like... It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so My much pleasure. for putting Thank you. Up. There have done studies. There are things that you know are passed on, genetic trauma. But what I would like, especially for artists within the Black diaspora working within the U.S., is to think that the diaspora is so much bigger than here. Yeah, right. And when you think of Jacob Lawrence, he's looking at Haiti. When we have, our histories are interconnected, mm -hmm. and until we're able to say, 
we're all part of that same history, it's um, it's powerful. But it's, it's like the legitimacy, like I, as an American, especially like hearing someone like you speak, it's so hard to feel that you have a legitimate voice when you go beyond the 400 years. Although mm. the memory, pardon? Oh. Although the memory goes, the memory goes beyond the 400 years, but it's that, it's that feeling of, how can I speak about something that I don't know? And in the end, it's the body though, right? Yes. And like, the struggle then is to not have this didactic body that can only be, like, when we do portraiture, it's limited to what we understand of the moment. And it's like, if you want to access time, you have to almost break out of it. And that's where I, I think I kept getting, keep getting caught in this, like, figuration, abstraction, schism. <laughs> but it's because I'm trying to yeah, break out of that. And so maybe we have to get out of history. Like, history is just another tool set. So my, my practice is kind of tricky in the sense that um, I am a, almost, I, I'm not ADD, <laughs> but I work in, I, I have this like energy that makes me want to work on a million things at once. And so that means that in order for it to be productive, I have to focus it on the studio. And so there are so many demands outside of actual making and being an artist that um, can distract from that, especially if you're not doing one thing that you're focusing on for a specific amount of time. Um, so that's where having museums is really helpful because, for instance, the show at the Perez Museum versus, for instance, having a, working with commercial spaces is the difference. In a museum, you can have this encyclopedic view of things and be working on ideas. And those ideas can vary in materially. You can do all the different things like sculpture, photography, painting, video, and it'll all be cohesive. You're not worrying about all the boundaries. And um, for the Perez Museum exhibition at PAM, I actually moved my studio to Miami so that I can be in a year-long conversation with a curator. She could come to my studio, I, we could see the space the exhibition was going to be in, and really respond and make it a cohesive conversation that was happening in real time. That was such a gift. And negotiating that with the museum so that they were taking the budget, for instance, out of shipping and turning it into production mm -hmm. is something that seems inaccessible, but it's a viable question. You can say, hey, how about we get a cheap studio in Miami and work on this thing here? And that way it can be responsive, site-specific. Saya Wolfat taught me that. <laughs> oh, you know my love. I feel like um, Moa takes the risk to have these conversations and shows that are not always that happen before other people are ready for it. And then they become established and they become accepted. It's almost like you have to be the lens cleaner to say, hey, this is this is worthwhile. And then other spaces will be like, oh, oh, I see it. Let's do it too. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I've been actually coming to the Headlands since 2013. And I've always appreciated the programming here. It's been really exciting. It's interesting because I'm in this in-between space. I've grown to be comfortable in that in-between space. I feel like it's the most, we talk about interstitial generative spaces. But when I'm here, I'm never American. When I'm in the Dominican Republic, I'm never Dominican. So I've learned to always be both at the same time. And so the subjects I address in my work are only because of my upbringing and acculturation in the US. But I was raised until I was eight and a half in the Dominican Republic. All the psychic foundation is if is in, in growing up in the border in Loma de Cabrera, in the Jabón, in northern Haiti, in a border town between Haiti and Dominican Republic. And being able to see the river from my grandma's backyard and see the back and forth. All the stories that from outside are said are impossible 
my family, my dad's of Haitian descent, my mom's of Dominican descent, the things that are said are impossible. I was living with in a daily basis. Um, they were my family, they were my history, they were the food and language I was speaking. So um, again, it's, it's like being comfortable with finding spaces and claiming spaces that are said to not be and um, making something out of it. Yeah, I feel like that's just um, an easy methodology. They, they want to be like, Phew, so much work and, and actually making something multifaceted. But um, <laughs> there, there are, um, there's also so much room in being able to give things grit and nuance. Um, one of my very first understandings of an encyclopedic museum were uh, that that children's book, like Mrs. Something Something's Night at the Museum, these two kids who basically run away from home and spend it and they live off of the fountain and like, yeah. it was always a dream. As a kid, I wanted to be able to run away into a museum and be able to see all the different archives. And part of it wasn't necessarily the stories being passed down by the strictures of, and the methodologies of museology. Like it was about the fantasy that you could invent as a viewer in the potential lives of that object. Um, so in the end, I think like academia, that's just a, that's just like a, a, a cage that we very clearly can break out of. Fred Wilson does that. He's luckily invited to do that. Um, but the more we can have that within the actual practice of museum creating, the better we'll be for it. Parable of the Sower is going to become a TV series. So a lot of people are going to become familiar with her. But when we think of Make America Great Again and the wall and collapsing economies and collapsing environments, she's writing that in the 70s. So um, she's such a visionary that you have to pay attention when such a clear voice speaks. Um, and so a lot of the work that's out there is as much listening to her as it is listening to you know, the folklore growing up and the signs that were passed, uh, that I passed when I was going in my school bus. I feel like reading her just echoes our experience so much and it can maybe open, like you were saying about labeling specific objects, Octavia is doing that for everything, every day. I feel like fledgling is the only one where I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> what happened there? I'm not ready. So maybe in like 40 years we'll be ready for that. But um, yeah, she's just crisp. So, so great. So one thing that, um, as much as I love looking at history, it's never from the point of nostalgia. I feel like nostalgia can be the one thing that can be like a warm fire on one end, but it could also be the thing that's burning your alive on the other. Um, it doesn't allow you to grow, yeah. So um, you have to get a point of connection. If that point of connection is trying to go back to Africa, then you have to give yourself room. But if you have the understanding that your act of being alone, that you're navigating the world alone, is already such a strong filter, is already, um, you know, you can't help but mediate. And if you notice all the mediation, then you have the answers to that work. And it's just like you're telling them, like, your being is enough. You are enough. So it gives you a voice. It gives you a voice. Sometimes it's hard to say to see it, especially when the outside world is saying, oh, you need to strive for this. You need to be other than what you are. When the media that you're viewing every day says you're like, oh, metamorphosis is at hand. You can like change everything. You're like, okay, let's change some things. But then you're like, okay, others are really 
at, for you to play. I feel like as soon as we tell somebody, especially young people, don't do this, that's exactly what they're going to want to do. <laughs> so just say, like, let's help you find what you want. It's probably a little easier.